Mr. Hartenstein, Michael Lavely is the superintendent of schools, but also serves on our chamber board. And he has a uh, somewhat enviable task to spend about $4.6 million in six months or something like that. And he's going to tell you about this. And all the exciting things that are happening with North, North Kansas City Schools. Some of you who came to our annual dinner had a chance to see some of this. But uh, this is a little bit different presentation. So if you would, please welcome Superintendent Michael Hartenstein. Good evening, what a great turnout. Everybody's here, thanks for coming. Um, well, I had a real privilege, uh, first of all, of calling uh, Mayor Hill, Mayor, thanks so much. Uh, I have to tell you, I have a, a, just a tremendous amount of respect for the city. Um, I've only been here a couple of years, and uh, I'm just so thrilled with uh, the relationship I have uh, with the fire department, the police department, uh, Eric Bowles, uh, I see Eric on the line, uh, Dan, a bunch of folks, Mark, uh, folks from the city council. Um, and it's really spent a fair amount of time with the Chamber of Commerce. I want to kind of give you a, a little bit disjointed presentation. I apologize for that. I, kind of, I tried to put together a couple different things this evening to kind of communicate some information. And hopefully we can get this thing to work. Let me, uh, let me introduce something new here. We have a, a, a new tagline that you'll be seeing a lot more of uh, from here on out, and it's called Viking Strong. And it's uh, something that we're really impressed with because um, when Mike Lane handed the district over to me. The district was in great shape. Uh, it had survived, and he had done a really nice job of carrying it through some pretty significant changes, I think, having to do with the closure of Uber and so on. Um, but now we're kind of re-energized. We've had some, some opportunities to kind of make some different changes, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of where we are, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we're going to go. So that's why it's a somewhat disjointed presentation. Uh, once again, we have uh, tremendous financing capabilities uh, with our treasurer, Todd Tolson. Uh, once again, the treasurer has won the seal of approval from the state auditor. And I'm going to tell you just very briefly about some financials. Uh, we don't spend as much time on that uh, as the city does. But you'll notice that one of the things that's happened here, the blue line, uh, are the receipts. That's the money that we receive. And much like the city, we have some difficulties because it's very difficult for us from time to time to predict exactly how much money we're going to be operating with. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, I want to thank the governor for helping balance the state uh, budget on the backs of <laughs> municipalities and, and uh, the school districts. And, and I understand that that's certainly you know, one way to do it. But it has made it somewhat difficult for us. And, and just like the city, we have uh, had to struggle also with things like tax collections because most of our income comes from personal property taxes. And notice the red line it is an increase in our expenditures. And uh, one of the things that, that we try to do is examine all the time how can we run things more, uh, more lean, and I'll give you some more information about that in just a bit. There are some interesting things that we have coming up. One of the things that we talk about uh, fairly frequently in my place is our, well, our some changes in the state teachers retirement system which take effect in 2015. And what that really means to you here in the city, and clearly what it means to me as your superintendent, is taking a look at several things. One is how do I replace potentially 60 or 70 people who would be incented to leave next year if they so choose to because it works against them if they, if they elect to stay. There's really a penalty if they want to stay. So there's a possible out, uh, uh, outgoing of, of a significant portion uh, of um, my personnel and that's, that's a significant challenge because we have tremendous talent in the school system and it's just depressed all the time. The other challenge with that is uh, we have suddenly folks who are at the uh, upper end of the pay scale who will be leaving, and we pay service pay the following year just like everyone else does, but then the challenge is, you know, can we help fix that red line um, by perhaps bringing some folks who aren't necessarily uh, as mature and therefore making the same kind of income. So part of what we're going to do, just as, uh, as David talked about, how do we address some of the challenges we have going forward is we take a look at that large pool of folks which really represent about almost 25% of our teaching core and how we might address those folks. Uh, this obviously poses a challenge as well because uh, just like those two lines uh, don't merge and they're, and they're splitting, it means that a few years from now we're potentially looking, if we can't change some of those dynamics, we'll be looking at possibly in a couple years of another tax levy if we can't fix that problem. And that's not something we're interested necessarily in doing, um, but it's something that might be a reality. I will tell you, and you'll see in later slides, that we have been aggressively looking for the past year in particular at how we can start moving many of the kinds of projects that need to be funded typically out of the general fund uh, to other kinds of sources of revenue, just like the city has done as well. They've done a magnificent job of, of 
of going after grant money and looking for other resources for that. And we'll be, we will be doing the same. Some interesting things that I thought I would share. Since I've been here in two years, we've had a drop of enrollment uh, in the last two years of just over 100 students, and we lost 22 this past year. So the, the, the student population is shrinking a little bit. The uh, number of meals have gone down uh, a little bit. Um, but an interesting number here that I wanted to point out, if I can get this thing, I'm not sure this is how it goes. Uh, if you look down, it says 2012-2013, uh, 19.34 and 2013, 2014, 20.18. Um, those are the number of free reduced lunches, and that's really an important number because it's actually used by the federal and state government as a measure of poverty in a community. And I think most folks in this community would be surprised to know that um, about 10 years ago, the number was less than 10, less than 10% here in the city of North Canton. So it's been a dramatic shift in the socioeconomic status uh, of our folks. And that has huge implications. I'm in the human development business, and I have to make sure that I, uh, I'm able to take the kids as they come to me and do the very best that I can with them. So we've increased uh, our opportunities for breakfast in the morning for, for uh, children. We feed many, many more children, and it's reflected in the numbers of, uh, that you see up there. Because we have a lot of kids who come to school who aren't really prepared to learn, and obviously they haven't eaten. And we're very concerned about students over the summer. We worry about kids on weekends and so forth. But it's, uh, it's kind of a startling number, and every time I show this to folks, I get kind of an interesting reaction. Transportation numbers are actually down just a little bit from where they were before. Um, most folks don't realize that we run a fairly significant transportation fleet. Uh, we have approximately 40 buses at a particular time out running around. Uh, and we have some very interesting challenges here, which again, most folks are not aware of. And I'll just give you a couple different scenarios. Uh, we are bound by a federal and state law to provide a free and adequate education for all students, regardless of what opportunities they may or may not have with them. And we certainly embrace that. And I think it's one of the things which makes the public school system in this country what it is. Um, An editorial comment or side note here I should mention, uh, every time you see those PISA scores, which talk about we're 17th in the world on math, uh, I'm actually someone who's done a lot of research on PISA scores, and I've spoken about it at the college level. It's very interesting to know those scores come out every three years, and in this country they're done in three different sample sizes at three different locations in this country. And what, they, what happens is they're always, they're always uh, gathered from different size uh, school districts, public school systems, and geographically distributed across the country, which also have different socioeconomic and demographic breakdowns from each other. But they're all public schools, which means we take everybody. Everybody who comes to us, we take, and we try to do the very best we possibly can for each and every child. That's not who we are compared against. So it kind of sticks in my cross a little bit when we're compared against school systems in Singapore and Finland and other places. And oh, by the way, uh, in eighth grade, they, they take off a bunch of kids and put them in vocational programs, or they put them in other kinds of programs, or they stop educating them completely. And again, it doesn't seem like we're comparing apples to apples. But we take care of everybody. That's who we are. Um, last year, uh, I spoke right before we had a levy, and we had a program improvement levy. I want to thank all of you again, uh, and, and we'll continue to thank you each year for this. It's a continuing levy, and, and as I mentioned last year, folks asked me why is it a continuing levy, and it's for the same reason that the mayor has to come up with a budget each year for sewer and water and so forth. Those problems are not going to go away. Buildings fall apart, they need a new roof. Um, if you've been in our driveways lately, it looks like back in Beirut. Uh, it's very difficult, some of the potholes, those things need to be fixed and attended to, and we're certainly doing that. But you'll notice that, uh, under that item that we talked about doing district repairs and buses and doing technology and instructional materials, and, and we'll, we have certainly done that, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, another big thing which we did last year, which was a, a huge issue, I'm sure everyone was aware of it, we had a major labor contract. Um, it's a three-year contract with our certified staff, which means our teachers. Um, and I have to tell you, this, is, this was a really difficult, um, I think a really difficult contract for lots of folks. Um, much like the city, we don't really have much more money. If you saw the receipt, you noticed that it was flatlined. And we had asked the teachers, when Mike was here before, we had asked the teachers to take a pay freeze, and it was a pretty comprehensive across the board freeze. And to their credit, they stepped up, they looked at the numbers, they realized that it was a serious problem. Uh, so for quite a few years, they, they were sitting on, on no changes. <laughs> Um, and, and that's great, and I, and I applaud that. It also makes it very, very difficult for us to hire the best and the brightest when they know that this institution is not necessarily moving forward on that. So at the time, we're trying to build an absolutely world-class, the best public school system in the world, and that's what we're trying to do. It's very difficult in those circumstances. 
But to the credit of the teachers and the union and the administration, uh, we got together and everybody knows we got that done. And there are some very interesting features in that contract. Uh, yes, we gave them a little bit of money on the base, but the, the vast majority of funding is actually uh, contingency funding. So what happens is they get a little bit more, not much, but they do get a little bit more if we get a little bit more. And they agreed to that and they, see, they thought it was fair and we certainly thought that was fair as well. So if we don't have it, they don't get it. And if we do, well, we're happy to share a little bit with them. We did an enormous amount of work uh, with safety and security. I want to thank uh, Chief Baker and Chief Wilder for both in the audience tonight for helping us with that. Uh, I think most of you know we did Alice, uh, which is the alert lockdown, inform, countermeasure, or in, not a, I don't remember what the E was, uh, escape, I think it is. Thank you. Uh, and we instituted that last year. We had a town hall meeting. Many of you were there for that. Uh, and we have done an enormous amount of work on safety and security, and I'm very, very proud of this. There's few things as a superintendent which, which really keep me up late at night or, or make me wake up at 3 in the morning. But this is actually one of those issues. Uh, anytime there's a shooting or uh, something happens, uh, you know, the, the worst fear you could possibly have is that something happens to one of your kids. And your kids are my kids, so I do worry about that. But we have done some, some significant things. Um, we've done some, some building improvements, some expansions in our buildings. We've built vestibules, security vestibules. Not everyone's been necessarily happy with that, but we think it's a great thing. And you'll see when you come back in the fall that we're adding security vestibules also to the middle school and the high school and they'll be in, in place as well. We've also changed procedurally some things that we do, and I want to thank again the Chiefs for helping us with that, coming in and taking a look. They did some audits for us. Um, and took a look at how we conduct some of the business that we do. So it wasn't just money that we spent to kind of harden or, or tighten the buildings, it's how we kind of do what we do. Uh, I think many of you know that uh, a lot of things which happen in public schools happen within the school system itself. So it's not enough to necessarily build a moat, we have to take care of the folks that are inside the buildings as well. And we really have three big initiatives. We have a Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports, PBIS, it's a program that, that Mike started when he was still there, and we've expanded that. Um, there's a lot of training involved with that, and that's helped us uh, understand what's going on with kids who may be out of control and de-escalating issues or recognizing problems in buildings. Uh, we are very, very active with Character Counts. I serve on the North Canton Character Counts Board, and I want to congratulate our Board of Education for stepping up, this is many of the others, because one of the things that we added last summer was a um, Position. We actually hired two people who wanted to split the position who work uh, part time in our district, much like a coach, representing character counts. We do a lot of character development. We talk about character, what is integrity, what's responsibility, and, and those types of things in our buildings. It's very, very active. And then finally, this past fall, we added a big initiative built around diversity and bullying. Uh, there has been an increase in uh, sort of some chatter that I hear about as a superintendent um, about uh, cyberbullying and other kinds of things. Some of it coming out of the middle school primarily, but some other kinds of places. And those are the kinds of things which trigger kids. And so obviously we want to be in front of that. So we hired uh, a national expert who, um, as a consultant to come in and help us with both diversity and bullying. And we've had programs in all the buildings. Uh, he comes in and he gives me a lot of consultation time as well. Uh, it's also someone that Mike had worked with before, and I met him, I thought very highly of him, he does a wonderful job. Another big initiative, the big initiative that we started last year uh, and carried forward this year is English Language Arts. Um, again, when the district didn't have much funding because of the, the loss of the Uber company, uh, the car dealerships and so on, one of the things that, that happens is you just sort of circle the wagons and do the best you can with what you have. And that's fine, and, but as we realized that the funding was going to be flat and we were able to make some changes, uh, we identified that one of the problems we had was with reading and literacy specifically in the school district. And we started actually uh, right around Christmas of 2013, uh, excuse me, 2012, and carried it over to this past year, 2013, excuse me, 2013 to 2014, I did, I did it right here. Um, and what we did was we had some reading specialists come in to conduct some audits in our buildings and take a look at both our scores and how we're teaching, what does the curriculum look like, what are the materials, are they properly aligned. And we ended up uh, getting a grant, I want to thank Sandy, I saw Sandy here someplace else earlier. Uh, Sandy from the Sandy Mike from the library worked with us. We had a $145,000 rough grant, somewhere in the neighborhood, to do some professional development based around literacy with new materials. And we also um, bought, purchased a brand new textbook series out of that permanent improvement funding. It was about uh, almost $300,000 investment, again, by the Board of Education. And uh, we have been involved very heavily in unfolding that program and really trying to produce uh, better results. It's, it's absolutely fundamental. If kids can't read, they can't learn. 
It doesn't matter what you're trying to do. Uh, reading literacy and numeracy are at the core of everything that we do. And we identified that we have some issues we need to deal with, so we have made a massive investment both in terms of funding and people and priorities in our district based around that. And then there's a straight A grant, $4.6 million, and I'm going to talk more about that in just a little bit. These are all big, big initiatives that have, have been going on since I came to see you last year. I want to mention specifically because folks ask me, uh, Dottie and the rest of the folks ask me, well, what did you do with the money that you got from the, the PI levy? Uh, from it right now, you can see that I'm going to read through this. Uh, there have been some significant upgrades. One of the great things about that, again, as I mentioned, is it's a continuous fund, so it allows us to kind of build in a very systematic way in a very prioritized way, those things that, that, again, the district just didn't have the funding to take care of. And um, the district had a strategic plan a few years back before I got here, and one of the things which was identified in that strategic plan was the need for a PI levy to do exactly these kinds of things. I want to mention something out here that may not uh, pop out at you, but those, those digital radios are something that I'm particularly pleased about. Um, and this was something that we worked with Chief Waller on. The, the digital radios allow us to have instantaneous communication with all staff members anywhere on any campus at any time. And it's monitored by the police department 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, all year round. So again, our response time uh, back into our city services, uh, safety services is, is significantly heightened. And again, it just really speaks to uh, the partnership that we have with the city. But this has just been a tremendous shot in the arm for, for all of us. Well, I did the same thing that Mayor Hell did. I, I sent a note out about two weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, and I said, send me information about all the great things that are going on in your buildings. And it took about a week, and I, but then I got bombarded. And then I had the problem of the 460-some slides. I really did. It was, um, it was amazing. Uh, we just have an amazing uh, group of kids, and we have amazing staff. So what I'm going to do, and I apologize for anybody who's in here and they wanted to see um, who won the quilting be at the third grade in, in Mrs. Jones's room. Um, but what I really wanted to do was just kind of highlight some of the really big things because it's just it's just an outstanding district, and I'm not going to read through all of these. You can you can certainly read some of those. But what I'm really interested in, one of the things that struck me is it, it, the high end caliber of some of the programs that we offer here, and not only how high end the caliber of those programs are, but how well our kids do in those programs. And I was struck. We just had a Zoom celebration in this room about two three weeks ago, about two weeks ago, I guess. And I was really struck by the number of kids that were coming through with, with just gigantic uh, grade point averages that were looking at science, technology, engineering, and mathematics as a career choice. And again, it speaks to just the caliber of folks that we had in the building. But we had everything from um, just the tremendous uh, speech teams and, and arts programs, and, and again, just, you'll see that the marching band did really, really well this year. Um, we got tremendous, this was just recently, the Iron Crafter. I thought this was really, really cute. If you saw this in the paper, I, was, I thought it was just tickled. Kids were given a, uh, a box of materials, and they had a set period of time to compete with other kids in the room to come up with something. And it's actually the bottom right hand picture is the Iron Crafter. And so they came up with Wonder Woman. And so they had the, the, the young lady down in the bottom right hand corner of the picture was able to put that together, and they won that event. But we have kids that show up to start kind of the art show. We have kids who present the governor's uh, art show in Columbus, and so forth. So it's just tremendous. Everybody knows about our, our, our athletic teams. Um, I wasn't sure quite where to put the, uh, the girls' basketball state runner-up because I wasn't sure which year that fell in, but I was so proud of them that, that I had to stick it in there just because. Just uh, but we had kids that, that compete really well. And Tony Pauly sent me the list from the high school, and Margie sent me the list from the middle school of all the kids that had done stuff, and it really ran on, I think it was 14 pages that they won at very small. And no, I am not kidding. Uh, which is great, except, you know, my poor secretary has to help me print all those, those uh, letters out that I have to sign. Thanks, Mike Lee, for setting it up for me. Um, but they just do really, really well. And, and I'm really proud of our programs. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have sports. We have kids doing all kinds of things all the time. It's just, it's just a wonderful place. And if you're, it, it's important because if you're a student who um, perhaps isn't a strong student and you need some place to be or some, something to do and some way to connect with the institution, this is just one of the many ways that you can and you don't have to be a, a state uh, runner-up to do that, and, and that's great. Okay, I want to talk about academic accomplishments. Uh, when I was interviewed, they, they told me that we were a AAA school district. We do academic arts and athletics, and of course the trick question was, which one is the most important? Thank you, Mrs. Kling, and the rest of you board members for setting me up on that one. We are an academic institution first, and I'll let you figure out what the other two, what rank the other two come in. Uh, you'll notice a whole bunch of A's up there. There are a couple B's. We're working hard on that. 
Uh, these are on uh, just general district measures that are coming up. I'll walk you through a few of these. These are on uh, standards which are met, met 100% of the standards. Um, again, this is North Canton City Schools, of course we did. Um, this is something I was really interested in. There's some wonderful new metrics that are available to me that uh, superintendents didn't have in the past. And where you want to be is the upper right corner. Where are we? We are in the upper right corner. This is the progress of the school district as a measure of its performance. And it's just a great mess of different kinds of things. But the simplicity of it is that, frankly, as far up and to the right as you can get, that's where you want to be, and that's where we are. Um, here we are, just uh, the breakout of our students. Most folks don't know that we're 93% uh, Caucasian, but the number of kids, the minority kids, are, are increasing. Our spending per pupil is pretty interesting, and again, this goes back to a variety of things. But uh, what you'll notice over here is that our, our operating spending per pupil for the district is $8,253. The statewide average is $8,814. Um, the classroom instructional study, it's hard to read, is 5670 and statewide it's 5953. And these are the kinds of numbers that help spur us towards that $4.6 million. Because again, we're not going to be competitive, we're not making the investment in our classrooms the way that we should. <laughs> And certainly one way to do that is to go out and try and find some grant money that's obviously that's what we do. Um, this is really interesting. This is spending versus performance. And again, where you want to be is as high up on this chart as you can. The further to the right you are, uh, the more money you're spending. And the higher up on the chart you are, the greater your performance. So you want to be left and up by the top. And we are left and up by the top. So be pleased with that. Um, this is a source of revenue. We do get a greater percentage of, of our revenue. It's about 51% from local taxes versus anything else. Uh, most of the states below 50%, it's in the, it's in the mid 40s. Uh, we're at 51.4, the statewide average is 40.1. So we are much, much more dependent upon our folks locally to help with that. And, and I'm, I'm okay with that because frankly, this, the revenue from the state is real tricky. Half the time you're not quite sure what you're gonna get. And sometimes you do and you wish you did. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, Straight A Viking 21 for a minute. And it's not so much to beat our chest uh, about the grain itself as what's going to happen as a result of it. And I'm actually going to make a change here, so bear with me one second. It's easier if I do it. Uh, the same evening as the SUMA celebration, which I think was March 18th, I think, um, there was the, uh, the North Canton Chamber of Commerce uh, annual dinner, uh, and so I wasn't able to present it, couldn't be both places. So I had these folks uh, come in and tell uh, folks over there that evening about uh, the Viking 21 project. And what I'm going to do is, oops, back too fast. Uh, this is uh, one of the great things about education, and I'm, I am not a teacher. Uh, I came to education late, but I've spent a great deal of time studying it. Um, one, of the things, one of the great things about education is that in researching it through the last few years, I've noticed that, and I'm sure you have too, it really doesn't look like it's changed a whole lot. Um, back when I was the COO of, of another school district, I, I can recite all the statistics. I can tell you that the average classroom size in this country is, is 900 square feet. The average number of students in that space is 28.1. I knew how many square feet was allocated per child. I knew the fire codes inside in terms of how much, what had to be done with respect to the door on that. I knew about ingress, egress. I knew about lighting requirements and lumens. I knew all that stuff. But you know what? If I looked at it, other than the fact that the technical aspects of it had improved, for the most part, it's still the same. We still had one person in the front of the room, kids lined up in rows, and who was doing all the work? Who's doing all the work? So one of the problems that we have, and this is the same So one of the problems that we had was how could we change that? It was really motivated by uh, a lot of research that we had been doing uh, when I first got here. And the research which we knew, uh, and I, can't, I come from the private sector, is that in the private sector people collaborate and they critically think about problems together. 
and they communicate solutions and they test them. If they don't work, they, they get back together and they continue to work on those problems in a very different kind of format. And in there, there's three things which really impact, at least today as we saw, what happens you know, in that kind of space. So that whole notion of collaboration and communication and critical thinking. Pedagogy is how do you do it? It's the science of teaching. It's what, you know, what is teaching? That's what pedagogy is. And technology, we all know what technology is. And space is the third dimension which we had a lot of research on and we had, uh, well, a lot of research on that. And we were identifying how space either helped or hindered what happened at the point of instruction. And so what we decided to do was to take a look at all of these and see if we couldn't create a different kind of environment. If we could create an active learning environment where the kids were engaged and they were collaborating, thinking critically, and then communicating things a little bit differently. And here's why. We wanted these kinds of experiences to happen. We wanted real-life opportunities for kids to work on problems together, obviously in a very guiding way, with some of the latest technology that we could find. And we wanted to make sure that the space that they did it in added to that experience. If you think about it for a minute, if you walk in, let's use Hoover High School as just an example. If you walk into Hoover High School, how much of the space in the high school is dedicated simply to transport kids back and forth? Or how much of the space, which is general meeting space where kids get together, is simply that? It's a place to park butts and seats. It's really, it really isn't optimized for actually adding to instruction. Now again, if you're a business person, you know that you use all your capital expenditures as best as you can to contribute to your bottom line in the best way that you possibly can. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're going to do with this project. Well, we need to take a look at pedagogy first. And to do this, in our grant, we determined that there were some things that we could do really well, and perhaps a few things that we weren't quite so good at. And we decided that, well, who's really good at professional development? Well, how about Walsh University? Guess what? They're right here. They're really good, and we should be partnering with them. And so we are. And so we set about, we had some preliminary meetings to talk about how might we change the professional development to change such that we change what's actually happening in the classroom. So we sort of flip around a little bit. Who's doing some of the work and how that's happening? And we determined that the best way to do that is that we were going to use the Amway model. Does everybody know the Amway model? It's where you get a few folks together and they go out and become your disciples and they go out and sell that idea to other folks. Well, that's our internal champions. I couldn't use Amway for some reason. That was trademark. Uh, so we have 27 internal champions that we have identified through a process. We, we threw open the doors, we had a bunch of meetings within the school district, we explained what we were doing, and we asked folks how many would like to do it, and the problem was paring it down to 27. It was, it was that impressive. We've also asked uh, Walsh to not only help us train those champions, but help us provide the evaluation. So they did benchmarking on what kinds of skills do these folks have, how do they employ those skills, what kinds of results do they get. So that moving forward over the next five years, longitudinally, do we in fact see some measurable changes based upon student performance with respect to this project? Space. Well, here's, here's the interesting thing. Space in, in our buildings, uh, some of our buildings are fairly old, and some of them not so much so. But we do have some interesting problems in terms of how the rooms do not necessarily lend themselves to some changes. Let's see if I can get this to work here. Oops, no, I'm getting that. I may have to run over the mouse for something. Perfect. You'll notice, um, hopefully that's going to move. There it goes. You'll notice that in, in this video in the middle here, that what's really occurring is the fact that the spaces themselves are changing. It's very, very dynamic. And the reason this is really important is we want to be able to group, regroup, and regroup again at the drop of a hat so that we can change the configuration in our classrooms. So there's really no front of the room, there's really no back of the room. If we want kids to work in teams, we can work in teams. If we want kids to work one on many, the teacher in the front of them, we can do that. That we can bring boards in to have kids work collaboratively on boards. That we have technology in different locations so they can share what they're doing with their one-to-one -one computing initiative in the buildings as well. So what we wanted to do was to maximize how we took the space and used the space to fundamentally change the pedagogy itself. And when we started doing research, we ran into a couple different outfits. The third teacher group, Canon Design out of Chicago in Steelcase in Michigan, that we're all working on this. And we spent a lot of time talking to them and looking at their research on that space. And so we've partnered with Steelcase, and everyone knows Steelcase, to help us with that project. And 
One of the things which impressed us was A, the research that they had done uh, having to do with the impact of the space on instruction. And secondly, they had developed their own professional development team who was able to come in and work with our folks and help set up classrooms. Over spring break, uh, 27, I mentioned the 27 Amway champions, the, the, um, the early disciples, if you will. Ten of those folks got pilot classrooms and they were installed uh, over spring break. Uh, when they came back that first week, it was absolutely hilarious and it was just a week or so ago. It was hilarious to watch the kids walk in that room. The kids gravitated to it instantly. And one of the things that the steel case folks had done was they had set up sample room configurations. They put some boards up and they showed possible different ways, and again, there was some training involved, for how based upon things that you might want to do in the classroom, that you might want to have kids pivot the rooms. And so the teachers came up with names for each of the different pivot configurations. And with the exception of one class uh, midweek, I think it was biotechnology, we had a laptop. They forgot to unplug the laptop from the ceiling and they pivoted the room very quickly, which laptop did hit the floor. Uh, the, kids, the kids were completely into it. And it was really fun for me to walk in the room. And, and most of the time, you know, it becomes this clunky thing where kids rotate around. Everybody can pivot or, or swing around. Uh, and it was just a lot of fun to watch um, what was happening in there. Uh, we have technology coming into these classrooms in addition to the furniture and the whiteboards. The technology allows uh, different multimedia stations in the corners. I mentioned as part of our professional, or excuse me, our permanent improvement fund that we invested heavily in technology. It's a one-to-one -one computing initiative. In four years, every child in North Canton schools is going to have a computer of some sort to connect to. And those, those connectivity stations in the corners of the room allow them to plug in instantly, hit a puck, which has a button on the top, and then whatever's on their screen is then shared. It can be shared at that station, across the room, across the district, anywhere you want. So it's, it's essential. We changed all the smart boards out. Uh, the smart boards that we have have a life expectancy of about six or seven years. We had many that were breaking. Uh, the boards that, that Steelcase makes have a lifetime warranty, and that's very important because part of the screen was it had to be completely sustainable and things didn't fall apart. They're made with a steel and porcelain over the top. Uh, they have embedded um, processors inside the board. The teachers took to them. Uh, it was amazing uh, how quickly they took to them and how much fun they were having with it. Uh, they allow complete interaction in the front of the room. The kids come up. They get, you can beam whatever you have anywhere in the room. Um, it's very, very exciting. We'll obviously have an open house uh, when school starts in, October, in August, and I, I strongly encourage all of you to come and, and at least spend a few, uh, an hour or so, a few minutes, and nothing else, uh, in the buildings. I think you'd be hugely impressed. We're doing something else. Uh, we're changing our libraries, our media centers, and we're going to call them Imaginariums. And this is going to start in the fall. And the reason for this is we're not doing away with books. We're just going to kind of shrink the collection a little bit and, and put it in a, in a more centralized location. But what we're going to do is create spaces in the, what used to be the media centers to do some other kinds of things. Now, for instance, we're going to create a smudge space where kids can come in and be messy and play with arts and crafts materials and paints and so forth, play with play, those kinds of things. We're going to have a beatbox location. Yes, it's going to be noisy in the old media center. So if you want to play with GarageBand or MIDI interface or do some of those kinds of things, if that's your passion, you want some place to come and do controlled, educated play with music, music theory, beatbox is your location. We're going to create a video wall with a green screen behind it. We have some kids that actually know something about some video and media in our school district. It's probably the best high school television production of the facility in the country, and I really believe that. Uh, but we're going to create opportunities for other kids to work with video and, and use that kind of technology in ways that, again, they may not have access to either in their home or other places in the building. We're going to do something that's one of my favorites, weird science. If you've ever seen vernier science equipment, you can do some terrific kinds of hypothesis and measurements in, in what's going to be the weird science area. So there'll be a place in each one of the schools, uh, former media centers, for kids to do weird science. And hot on the heels of that is Tinker Space. And these are different kinds of materials for people to build things, take them apart. And uh, we actually have a structured way of doing this. So that we're going to give things to kids, let them take them apart and break them, and then try to get them to put them back together and find out how they actually work. It should be a lot of fun. Kids love games. Well, that's great. It's great that you're a, a, a gamer. I have a, a nephew who many years ago, when I was in IT, said, yeah, I want to, I want to be a game programmer. He had no idea what that meant, because he would love to play games, so he assumed he could be a game programmer. So when I showed him programming, he decided to pursue a different profession. But there are a lot of kids who really are interested in gaming, and if we give them an opportunity to understand how it actually works, how the simulations work, this is the place for them. So we're going to create gaming and simulation centers for them in each one of our imaginaries. 
systems. Uh, we're very heavily interested in robotics. We have a Project Lead the Way initiative currently. Uh, Todd Alkire and those guys at the high school do a great job. Uh, we also have them, you know, we have two programs right now, some more limited in the middle school. We're going to expand that for next fall, and then we're going to push systems thinking down through the imaginariums, and we've got a variety of different kinds of robotics teaching things starting uh, as early as fifth grade in, in those areas for those kids as well. Imagination destination is something that looks much more akin to what you would have expected in a library media center. We're going to make it much more comfortable for kids to come in and hang out with books. We haven't forgotten about that at all. And then we're going to tie all of it together with something called Challenger Weekly. What we're going to do, we stole this idea from the Metropolitan Children's Museum in Chicago. What we're going to do is have a theme each week where it doesn't matter which one of those centers appeal to you. There's a general theme that you can come in and work on it, either yourself or with another person or people. Uh, but built around a couple different themed ideas. So maybe you want to represent that in music, or you want to put together a video, or you want to play around some scientific apparatus to, to tackle that particular challenge. We're okay with that. Technology. Uh, there's a huge movement started at MIT about 10, 12 years ago called uh, Fab Labs or Maker Spaces. Uh, we're going to build one in high school. Uh, our Fab Labs are going to be a little bit different. They typically come in three levels. There's a, the low end level is the Education Fab Lab. Uh, and these spaces are uh, uh, equipment, which is primarily for kids just to learn on. They can't really do a whole lot with them. The next level of equipment in fab labs are prototyping labs, and their small businesses can, can come in. They can use prototyping equipment and actually build a very high resolution or high detail or high strength types of materials. But the equipment runs slower, so it's not the kind of equipment you would typically use in a production environment, which would be the highest level of a fab lab. Uh, a major part of our grant, and we went back to the, the state and said, look, we want to build up a prototyping level fab lab. No one's done it in a public school in the state of Ohio. Only a few universities have done it. We want to build one here because one of the things that we're interested in is see if we can't partner with local businesses. Uh, and we've already started that. We've had some discussions with some local companies already to come in and uh, give them access to that space after hours in, in return for that, that they would work with our kids on real-time projects. So an internship, externship, kind of apprenticeship thing, working with our kids and unifying some economic development here in the city. Uh, what's in the Fab Lab? Well, everything from CNC milling machines to, you probably have all seen 3D printers, 3D scanners, CNC router uh, mills, uh, laser cutters, die cutters, um, all the way down to just simple hand tools and, and those kinds of things. So it's, it's a very, very exciting space. We hope it's going to be very messy and loud, and the messier and louder it is, the, the more happy I'll be. So that's good stuff. Um, we have expanded our offerings in a variety of other kinds of areas as well. I'm pretty excited this, uh, as part of this grant. We purchased three high-definition, multi-point uh, distance learning systems from Polycom. And why that's important is because the board gave us uh, a contract to work with the Northern Ohio Technology Association, we're the only school district in Stark County which is doing that. Why is that important? Because there's a consortium of the most progressive school systems in Northeast Ohio which are offering courses real time online across the fabric of about seven counties. Uh, we will be offering Chinese One for the first time. We already have about six or eight kids signed up for it. Uh, we have a special space for them. It's real time, high definition, interactive video. Uh, the teacher, uh, I'm not, I just heard today that the teacher brush may not be teaching, so we have a different source that may be going um, to Rocky River, I'm not sure. Uh, but the, the teacher's located someplace else. Uh, they can see all of our kids, our kids can see the teacher, and, the, and they can switch back and forth to see kids in the other classrooms as well. We're also going to be sourcing our own first course on that network as well. It's going to be um, a Nick Playfax uh, Anatomy and Physiology class that he's going to be teaching on the network to a consortium of kids across Northeast Ohio. And we hope to expand that because, again, looking at, at, at the kind of offerings we want to provide our kids, we want a world-class educational system. We need to provide them the very best. Sometimes it's cost prohibitive. This is a way for us to do that. Our cost for the Chinese one is $200 per kid per year. It's an extremely low cost. And because we're sourcing a course on that network, uh, those costs are wiped out. So we're offering Chinese one and anatomy and physiology at no cost for our kids. So that's just a great win for us as well. There are some important goals about this grant, which made it very, very different. Uh, and that was the, Eric, I was thinking about you and some of the grants that you guys write in the back. Uh, first of all, we had, we had to do all these things, but the, part of the trick was we had to prove that we had to prove as best that we could that we believed the project was sustainable. And that was important because so often the state comes in and they give you some money and they come back five years later and they say, where's the project? Well, the project is gone. So we had to build in mechanisms in the application to indicate, and, and we think we did that fairly well, we obviously won. Uh, 
how we think we can actually sustain all these projects moving forward to keep them cost neutral. It also had to be something that other districts could do. So this, and we've already had a uh, visit by the state team. It was last week. They, to be frank, we just blew them away. I got a call from uh, the superintendent of public construction on Friday. He wanted to come up on Good Friday. I said, not a good day. We're not in session. I don't see our kids do anything. He said, how about Walsh? He said, they're a Catholic institution. I don't think Good Friday is good for them either. Um, so we're resetting that date, uh, but they're very, very excited about what we're doing here in North Kent. We've really taken the bull by the horns. The other trick is we have to spend $4.59 million by the end of June. And that's something that would be an easy, easy thing to do. It really, it really is. That's what we're doing. Um, it's been a great year. We've, we've had huge academic gains, uh, as you saw from some of those academic achievement charts. Uh, our costs are something we're taking a serious look at. We're a little bit concerned about personnel moving forward after next year. We've had a great season in terms of sports uh, and arts as well. Uh, we have a new school board with uh, two new board members that are, that are coming together very nicely. Uh, our, the board's been very, very supportive. They do a great job. i put a plug in for them because one of the things I think which has been different, I think, for folks in this community with our school board is that uh, boards are really changing across, uh, across the country, especially in Ohio. Uh, they're much more involved and, and interested, and, and I've been very pleased to have these folks working with me. Um, they've really taken on some specific challenges. They've invested an enormous amount of time on, on board briefings. Many of you have attended those board briefings. They've, they've invested the time to become knowledgeable on many of these kinds of issues so they can help uh, us make the kinds of decisions we need. Uh, they also help communicate both what's going on in, in the community to kind of give me the feedback and to help take that message forward. So, uh, I want to thank the, the board members, Mrs. Kling, and the rest for the work that they've done. It's been, it's been a great relationship. Uh, it's a great school system. I'm going to tell you right now that five years from now, we're going to be the best public school system in the United States. Thank you very much.